Hello, and welcome to the channel. If you're familiar with the TV show Dexter, you'll know that the show's main character is a person who carries a dark passenger. Dexter Morgan was a blood spatter analyst by day, serial killer by night. He would usually act alone, but regularly struggled with his dark passenger. What happens when that dark passenger is an actual person? who shares your passion for evil deeds. The case I'm going to share with you is exactly that. John Duffy and David Mulcahy share very little in common with Dexter Morgan, except for two things. They both killed, and both had a code. As I'm going to be discussing two serial killers, I thought it would be appropriate to bring in a little help of my own. This is why I've been joined by fellow true crime YouTuber, The Crime Real, who will be assisting me in sharing this case with you. I've left a link in the description to The Crime Real's channel, which I highly recommend you check out. Let's begin. John Duffy was born in Northern Ireland on the 22nd of November 1958. He was the second of three children. As a young child, he and his family moved to England. Not much is known about his childhood, but it's known that he attended Haverstock Secondary School in Chalk Farm, North London. Duffy was described by former pupils who knew him as a loner who would walk around in a duffel jacket with his hood kept up to keep himself to himself. Although, this rarely happened as Duffy was relentlessly bullied by the older students at the school due to his small stature and acne riddled skin. This dented Duffy's ability to socialise well and integrate with other students. Although one student would make friends with John, David Mulcahy. David was born in 1959 and very little is known about his upbringing, but we do know that his friendship with John Duffy began in Haverstock Secondary School. David's situation at school was very similar to John's, in that they were both considered disconnected by their school's social hierarchy. Not long into their friendship, they both learned of each other's desire to hurt animals. Most notably, Mulcahy, on one occasion, battered a hedgehog to death, as he was using the animal as a cricket ball. In terms of the pair's dynamic, David Mulcahy was the more violent of the two, although John himself also abused animals. As the pair's friendship continued to grow, they both pledged to never grass on each other should they get into trouble. They also began scaring couples late at night in the Hampstead Heath area by jumping out in front of unsuspecting couples. They would enjoy seeing the fear they gave people they frightened. Duffy also developed a keen interest in martial arts films, as well as the army. He would share this interest with Mulcahy, especially kidnapping techniques and hostage taking. However, after they left school, this worrying behaviour seemed to stop. By 1978, both Duffy and Mulcahy were married and had stable work, with Mulcahy training as a plasterer, whereas Duffy took on a carpenter's job that carried out jobs for various companies, one of those being British Rail. It was here that Duffy obtained his knowledge of the rail network, which as you'll learn, played a crucial role in the attacks the pair carried out. In July 1982, a 22-year-old woman, only identified as KJ, was walking home from a party. She had a teddy bear in her hands when she was abducted, dragged to a shed, stripped out of her clothes, blindfolded and brutally assaulted by two men. Duffy and Mulcahy's sick urges had officially gone well beyond that of abusing animals and scaring young couples now. This would spark the beginning of a horrific campaign of sexual assaults which would last for four years. In the first 12 months alone, 18 women would be savagely attacked by the pair near train stations, as well as mere minutes from Duffy's home in the Kilburn area. 
Their campaign of abuse would stop abruptly by the autumn of 1983. This was most likely due to John Duffy experiencing marital problems, leading to he and his wife separating. Although the two men would restart their series of assaults again in 1984, with another two cases taking place in West and North London. At the time, police had insufficient evidence to link these sexual attacks together. It wouldn't be until 1985 where three women were attacked by the pair on the same night. This was in the Hampstead and Hendon areas of London that the police decided to pool their resources together. They set up Operation Heart. It would become the largest investigation of its kind since the Yorkshire Ripper murders. In that same year, John Duffy was also arrested after assaulting his wife leading him to be placed on a police register of potential suspects in attacks. They were codenamed Z-Men. Despite the scale of this operation, the police were still no closer to solving the numerous sexual assaults which had taken place over the last few years. The media reported frequently on the crimes, but would constantly imply that there was only one culprit. Likewise, the police themselves were unsure as to whether they were dealing with one attacker or two. This left Duffy and Mulcahy with a sense of invulnerability. During the time they were active, they once broke into a car and stole a Michael Jackson thriller cassette and would play this while driving round, searching for potential victims. They were also able to successfully mask their crimes with the double lives they had set up for themselves. As mentioned, John Duffy was married, as was McCarthy. In terms of the power dynamic within the partnership, it was wildly believed that Mulcahy was the dominant of the two. While John Duffy's sadistic pleasures would be satisfied with the sexual assault of his victims, David Mulcahy, instead, got his thrills from inflicting violence and exerting fear from those they terrorised. Eventually, he wanted more. On the 29th of February 1985, 19-year-old Alison Day had arranged to meet her boyfriend at his place of work at Fairway Graphics. Her boyfriend's workplace was situated in North London at a desolate trading estate near Hackney Wick Station. While Alison was en route, she stopped at a phone box at around 7.10pm to book a taxi. However, the call ended abruptly, most likely due to Alison running out of credit. It's believed that on her way there, she took a wrong turn and was heading towards the canal. Unbeknownst to her, Duffy and Mulcahy were laying in wait. The pair abducted Alison and brutally attacked her, but on this occasion, Mulcahy called out to Duffy by his name. It's believed he did this as his intention was to kill their next victim and he needed a reason to justify this to Duffy. Alison was strangled with a tourniquet and her body was dumped in the River Lee. The pair placed granite cobbles into her coat to prevent her body from floating back to the top. Alison's body wouldn't be found for two weeks. The media refer to the attacker as the railway killer they mistakenly assumed, once again, that there was only one culprit. In February 1986, BBC crime show Crime Watch aired a segment reconstructing Alison Day's last steps and possible theories as to what happened to her. During this, her watch was shown, where the investigating officer confirmed she was dumped in the river at 8.10pm, as this was the time that the watch had stopped working. Mulcahy, now knowing that Duffy was comfortable with killing their shared victims, together plotted their next victim. On the 17th of April 1986, 15-year-old Marte Tamboza left her home in Horsley, Surrey, on her bike to buy herself some sweets. She had moved to England at a young age 
as her father's company had posted him here. As she was riding on the lane, she noticed that a piece of string had been tied across the path. It's believed she stopped in order to remove the string so she could continue her journey. But as she did this, Duffy and Mulcahy ambushed her and dragged her into a nearby wood, taking her some distance deep into it. There, they took turns sexually assaulting Marte. Like Alison before her, Marte was strangled with a tourniquet. Duffy would say that Mulcahy ripped off Marte's belt and looped it around her throat, telling Duffy, I did the last one. You'll do this one. After killing Marte, the pair fled the scene, but Mulcahy was said to have returned later to destroy evidence by attempting to set fire to Marte's body. Meanwhile, her family grew worried and contacted police to report her missing. Friends and neighbours began searching for the young girl. Her bicycle would be found a short distance from the path where the string had been in place, but by morning time, Marte was still not found. It wouldn't be until 8.30am where two gamekeepers who were out shooting at the time met up with police and took them to an area in the woods where they saw green plastic sacks. When they took police to where they had seen these green sacks, they grimly learned that they had found Marte Tambosa's body. Police searched the area and found the string that Duffy and Mulcahy used. They tested the wire and found it to be a rare kind of string, known as somyarn. They also found discarded matches that Mulcahy used when burning Marte's body, along with burned tissue stuffed inside her, done so in a clear attempt to destroy forensic evidence. A witness, Anthony Mabbott, told police that he had walked down the same path Marty took and saw the string still tied up. He explained that he took the string down and continued his journey, but he hadn't noticed Marte's bike out on the other side of the field. Witnesses also said that around 5.30pm, they had seen a man acting strangely on a separate field not far from where Marte's bike was discovered. And just before 6pm, witnesses saw a man with dirt on his right shoulder heading towards Horsley Station. This was important, as he would have been heading against the flow of people, as it was peak commuter time. The murder of the young girl prompted Surrey Police to set up Operation Bluebell, and another appeal was placed on Crime Watch. However, yet again, the appeal they made implied they were only searching for one man. Professor David Cantor, a behavioural scientist, was asked to provide the police with a profile of who they thought the wrongly assumed lone man would be. This was one of the first times in British history that an expert would be deployed to build a profile of this nature. David drew a profile which contained 17 main points. Of the 17 points, 13 matched John Duffy perfectly. These matching points were The killer lived in the Kilburn or Cricklewood areas of London. Duffy lived in Kilburn. The killer was married but had no children. The marriage was in serious trouble. The killer was a loner with few friends. The killer was a physically small man who felt himself to be unattractive. The killer had an interest in martial arts or bodybuilding. The killer felt the need to dominate women. The killer fantasized about sexual assaults and bondage. The killer had a fascination for weapons, especially knives and swords. The killer indulged his sex and violence fantasies with videos and magazines. The killer kept a souvenir of his crimes. The killer had a semi-skilled job as a plumber, carpenter or similar. The killer was in the age range of 20 to 30 years old. Although while Duffy was already known to the police due to his wife's earlier sexual assault allegations, as well as him being placed on the Z men list, he was able to slip through the fingers of the police. Many of his victims either refused to take part in identity parades or had failed to identify him when they did take part. 
It was said by some of his victims that he possessed laser eyes, which had a tendency to stare in the most disturbing manner. Duffy would be arrested on the 12th of May 1986 near North Weald Station after he was found carrying a knife. Unfortunately, as the police had no other evidence at the time to specifically link him to the murders, he was released. It would only take six days before one more woman would bear witness to his intimidating stare. On the 18th of May 1986, 29-year-old Anne Locke was at home when she received a call from her employer to see if she could come into work. Anne was a secretary for London Weekend Television and had been married for just a month. Upon speaking with her employers, she agreed to go in and made her way into work. She left her bicycle in the shed at Brookmans Park Railway Station in Hertfordshire. After leaving work at around 8.30pm, she headed back to the station to collect her bike. Unbeknownst to her, Duffy and Mulcahy had earlier spotted her bike and suspected that it belonged to a woman. They decided to lay in wait for the owner to collect it and spotted Anne getting off the train. After she got her bike, they followed her for a short time before abducting her, where they led her down the railway tracks to a field where she would be violently sexually abused before being strangled to death. After failing to return home, she was reported missing, and like the previous two murders, Anne's disappearance would be featured on Crime Watch, this time initially as a missing persons case. However, the investigator at the time did state it was likely Anne was already dead. Her body wouldn't be discovered until the 21st of July 1986, six weeks after she was killed. Her badly decomposed body was found with one sock in her mouth and the other tied around her jaw. There had also been another attempt to burn her body. The murder of Anne Locke prompted authorities to create a multitask police force. This would be known as Operation Trinity. It was the first multitask force created since the much heavily criticised Yorkshire Ripper inquiry. However, this inquiry featured for the first time basic computing systems, as well as early versions of Holmes, the Home Office Large Major Inquiry System. And unlike the flawed Ripper investigation, time was finally beginning to run out for one of the men. As stated previously, John Duffy was earlier identified as a potential suspect due to his wife's earlier sexual assaults allegation. As he was on the Z Men list, he would eventually be interrogated. When questioned about his whereabouts during the time of the sexual assaults and murders, he would claim that he had no knowledge as to what he was doing at the time as he had been mugged and beaten. The police would eventually release Duffy, but were suspicious of the answers he had given them. Duffy, not wanting to be interviewed again or potentially appear in court, decided to hatch the following plan. He would take himself to hospital, claiming that he had been mugged and was suffering from amnesia. The police weren't convinced of this claim, so Duffy took it another step further. He tried to pressure another friend of his to stage an attack and inflict real injuries to Duffy. However, he was unaware at the time that he was under police surveillance. Eventually, the media leaked this information out, leading Duffy to become aware and thus beginning a cat and mouse game between him and the authorities. His eventual capture would come about when he began to look for women to attack without Mulcahy. After stalking a woman in a park one night, the police apprehended Duffy and took him into police custody. With a short window of time to gather the evidence they required to charge Duffy with the attacks and murders, police brought in his wife for questioning. She revealed to police that she would often come home to find him watching violent martial arts videos, as well as how he would tie her up 
and force her to have intercourse. She even told of one occasion where he brazenly admitted to her that he sexually assaulted a woman and that it was her fault. ID parades were also carried out. Many of Duffy's victims failed to identify him, likely due to the sheer terror he and Malkahi inflicted upon them, although five women were able to positively ID him. While Duffy was interrogated for his crimes, he remained silent throughout. He was also keeping the promise he and Malkahi made as teenagers, as he said nothing about Malkahi's involvement. Meanwhile, police were also on the hunt for any evidence they could tie to the crime scenes they had left. They already had the SOM yarn string used when they murdered Marte Tamboza. Additionally, they also possessed several matchsticks and burnt tissues. Police discovered his book, The Anarchist's Cookbook, which contained details that eerily mirrored the techniques the men used when holding their victims hostage. Crucially, they were able to recover string from his mother's home, which matched the som yarn the pair used on the Dutch girl. His amnesia story would also fall apart when the man he asked to rough him up came to police to tell them what Duffy had planned. Lastly, while there was solid evidence for Duffy's role in the murder of Marte Tamboza, the evidence wasn't as strong for Alison Day and Anne Locke. However, after 70 items of John Duffy's clothing was forensically tested, they were able to identify fibres which matched those on Alison's clothing. After more intense testing, they were able to positively identify a further 13 fibres found on Day which matched Duffy's clothes. In essence, for the police, this was like finding John's fingerprints. In February 1988, John Duffy was tried for five sexual assaults, as well as the murders of Alison Day, Marte Tamboza, and Anne Locke. He was found guilty of four of the assaults, and the murders of Alison Day and Marte Tamboza. Sadly, however, he wasn't convicted for the murder of Anne Locke. He was sentenced to a minimum tariff of 30 years in prison by the judge residing, meaning he would have been eligible for parole in 2018. While Duffy was tried, convicted, and imprisoned, Mulcahy was a free man who had gotten away with murder. Safe in the knowledge that his best friend wouldn't grass on him, he was free to continue his life as normal and seemingly ceased his attacks on women now his dark passenger had been apprehended. That is until 1997, where everything began to unravel. Forensic psychologist Dr. Jenny Cutler was assigned to John Duffy after he was experiencing reoccurring nightmares. Since he was jailed, Mulcahy had not reached out to Duffy once. Furthermore, the guilt he carried seemed to get the better of him over time, leading him to feel the need to clear his conscience. The promise that he and Mulcahy made was soon to be broken. On one visit to Dr. Jenny Cutler in 1997, John Duffy casually informed her that he had not carried out the attacks alone. Dr. Cutler asked him if he could tell her which prison Duffy's accomplice was residing in. She was totally shocked when Duffy told her that he had never been arrested or convicted. Immediately after their meeting, she reported Duffy's revelation to the prison authorities as well as the officers who had worked on the original case. After reviewing the original evidence and forensically examining this using techniques not previously available to them in the 1980s, they were able to recover new evidence which linked Mulcahy to the murders. The police would also track him for several months until his eventual arrest on the 3rd of February 1999. Naturally, he denied any wrongdoing and claimed that Duffy was actually trying to portray himself as a victim of circumstance. 
In 2000, John Duffy would appear at the Old Bailey to give evidence against Mulcahy in what was the first ever time a highest category prisoner would give evidence against an accomplice. On the 2nd of February 2001, David Mulcahy would be found guilty of the murders of Alison Day, Martia Tamboza and Anne Locke. He was also found guilty of seven sexual assaults. He was handed three life sentences with a minimum of 30 years before he could be eligible for parole. As a result of the new evidence, John Duffy was convicted of a further 17 sexual assaults and was given an additional 12 years on top of his original sentence. Due to double jeopardy laws at the time, he wasn't convicted for Anne Locke's murder, although he did confess to his role in her death. Thank you for watching the video. It's difficult to put into words just how evil these two men were. Those who investigated Duffy and Malkahi seemed to agree that the latter was the ringleader of the two. Police believe the pair may have been responsible for many, many more attacks than the ones they were convicted for. Thankfully, it's accepted that these two will never be released from prison, meaning that they will never again get the chance to hurt another person. A special thanks to The Crime Reel for partnering up with me for this episode. Again, I've left a link in the description to his channel, which I couldn't recommend strongly enough. The cases he covers are very unique, so definitely check it out. Until next time, take care and goodbye. Psst. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to assist in the recording of this video. Cheers that crime guy. Please subscribe to this channel. Goodbye. For now.